and we are going to be in verse 21. Here we go. Start a little early. Mark chapter 1. <laughs> Oh, verse 21 okay. of chapter 1. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, no problem. Oh. <laughs> uh, as we started the Gospel of Mark, we see first that Jesus comes from the Old Testament. Uh, that's an important, the two passages that are referenced there at the beginning of Mark are from Isaiah chapter 40 and then Malachi chapter 3. John the Baptist was prophesied of in the Old Testament, and when he comes onto the scene, he prophesies of the one whose shoe latchet he is not worthy to, to buckle. So John prophesies of that one whom the Old Testament prophets also prophesied of. So Jesus, even though he is part of what we call the New Testament, he is also part of the Old Testament. That's an important connection that we want to keep. And then we have the idea that Jesus goes into the wilderness. We saw that. It's a very short passage, the way that Mark summarizes his time in the wilderness. And then from there on out, the rest of the gospel of Mark is going to be a demonstration of Jesus' authority. And we'll talk about that word authority here in just a minute. We see first that he has an authority, well, we know from chapter, um, excuse me, chapter 13, verse 13, I'm sorry, verse 13, even though it's a summation of Jesus' time in the wilderness, our study from Matthew reveals that Jesus has authority over the great, over the great deceiver, over the accuser, over Satan. And um, then he moves down and he calls these four different men to be followers of him. First, there's Simon, who we will later know as Peter, and Simon's brother, uh, Andrew. Jesus says, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And then the next two that he calls are James and John, sons of a man named Zebedee. And I, I was reading over the passage again this morning, and look at verse 20. He calls these two men, and straightway he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the ship. And uh, just an important thought to remember, not that we have nothing to do with our family, but God's call and for some of us, is that there is a leaving of the family. There is not a continuing of the family business, or there's not staying in the same location. That's not, the, that's not for everyone, but for some of us, that is the call, and that's an important call to grapple with for yourself. And, of course, there's a father, and I assume a mother that's got to deal with that as well, that, okay, our, our, my child has grown up, and they're answering God's call in their life, and it happens to mean that they will be taken away from, from us now. So we get to verse 21. So we have Jesus, and we have these four apostles, and they went into Capernaum, and straightway, on the Sabbath day, he entered into the synagogue and taught. Verse 22, and they, the audience there in the synagogue, they were astonished at his doctrine, at his teaching, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. The word authority here comes from the Greek word excusia, which has another connection to another word um, called existi. And what it means is, is to be lawful. So in other words, what Jesus is teaching, he is not teaching anything that is unlawful. Because I could stand up before you and teach things that contradict the Scripture, and you would all sit there and go, what kind of teaching is this, right? It contradicts the Word of God. Jesus was not contradicting the Word of God. He was illuminating the Word of God. And also, I love this, the word authority here has a meaning to, be, to, to exist and to be I am. So the authority is, it, we go back to the Old Testament when God speaks to Moses and Moses says, whom do I tell Pharaoh that has sent me? And God's response is, you tell them, I am that I am. And of course, the name Jehovah means the self-existing one. I exist completely on my own. And of course, none of us in the room can say that. We all have to tie our existence back to other human beings. 
and we have to tie our existence back to some original cause. And we in here today, one of the things that we all hold in common is we tie our existence back to the creator of heaven and earth. And therefore, our lives are not to be lived solely for ourselves. And now we see Jesus come into the scene and his authority, his very existence, his I am, he, it all rests within himself. And yet we will see, too, that he does not live only for himself. But here's a fascinating point that one theologian has pointed out. What does it mean that he taught with an authority that the scribes didn't have? Because the scribes were an authority figure, right? If they walked up and spoke, then you were to give them attention. Uh, Pentecost is the name of the theologian. He says this, scribes ultimately deferred to other men. And in fact, scribes became known <clears throat> when they opened up the Torah and spoke, they talked less about the Torah and most about what this rabbi said and what did this rabbi say and what did this rabbi say. And then they would follow the thoughts of these rabbis and it would become the traditions of men. Scribes, were one of the, scribes are one of those who lived according to the fear of men. And scribes were ultimately concerned, not what did the Torah say, but what rabbi said this, and what is the trend, and what is popular, and how can I align myself with what's popular and put forward my own brand? They weren't as interested, and Pentecost put it this way, they weren't as interested as putting the spotlight on the Word of God as much as they were interested in putting the spotlight on themselves. And another thing scribes were notorious for doing, and we'll see this later in some of the letters of the New Testament, the scribes were notorious for bringing up doubtful disputations. Let's squabble over these things that, while they are fascinating, they're not the thing we need to be mostly focused on. So they created a lot of confusion, and they were just focused on themselves. And Jesus stands up and preaches, here's what the text says. Here's what the text says. And the people notice this. Verse 22. Uh, verse 23, sorry, in the synagogue, now we're going to see that Jesus not only has an, author he has an authority over the Scripture, he's going to demonstrate an authority over everything. And while he's in the synagogue, we will see that he has an authority over the demons, over the unclean spirits. So I don't know if this guy was walking around and you didn't know he had an unclean spirit, and then the presence of God agitated that spirit within the man, <clears throat> but the spirit speaks out of the man, and as one um, one modern exorcist has said one of the ways that you know that someone is truly possessed of an unclean spirit is that when they go to speak, their mouths don't even have to move. And you can see that it is another voice that is coming out of them. So this man, this demon speaks from out of this man and says to Jesus this, let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Okay. And Jesus, what he says to the demon is, hold thy peace. Shut up. <laughs> Be quiet. And he commands a spirit to come out of this man. That is not what the unclean spirits want. They want to inhabit a body. They want to inhabit a human body. And we go all the way back to the book of Genesis. The sons of God who were fallen wanted the women of men. And they will, they will take on human forms, and they will have it, and they will possess. That's what they want. Why? They want to take over that which is not theirs. They are not creators. They are not ma the maker of heaven and earth. And they want to corrupt, and they want to control. And one of the highest things made by God is the human being. And they want to corrupt that and destroy that. And here is this unclean spirit having its way with this man and into the synagogue of all things. And Jesus shows up and the spirit speaks out. And Jesus says, be quiet and leave. And what we see next in the next verse is the unclean spirit as he had torn the man, he's throwing the man around. He's trying, to, he's trying to stay within the man's body. He cries with a loud voice, and he came out of him. And they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, what thing is this? What new doctrine is this? And of course, this isn't really a new doctrine. 
Elijah on Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal who are unable to call down fire, and Elijah prays to the great I Am who sends fire down from heaven. Moses who stands before Pharaoh and all of the gods of Egypt, and Jehovah just defeats one after the other. And Jesus says, I have, I have power over these unclean spirits, and they must obey me. What's fascinating about the spirit here is it will obey him, but it does not repent. And the audience says, what is this new doctrine? For with authority commanded he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. So they're astounded. Man, this guy knows how to speak. He knows how to teach the Torah, and he also has the power over these unclean spirits. And, of course, I'll stop right here and, and present for us everything we read in the Gospel of Mark, similar to the Gospel of Matthew, as we go through all of Scripture, and some of you are reading through the Bible in a year and while there are difficult things to, to grapple with, the evidence is laid out before us that God does exist, that Jesus is God. And so the question to us today, as the same question that the people are grappling with in our story is, how much evidence do you need? What do we need to ultimately put our trust, not in ourselves or in someone else or some other spirit, but to put our trust in God, the maker of heaven and earth? So after he casts out this unclean spirit, he, he demonstrates this authority over, um, over these demons. It says here, and immediately, verse 28, his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee, verse 29, and forthwith when they were come out of the synagogue. So what Mark does here stylistically is pretty fascinating. If we think in terms of a film, all right, if you're watching a movie, and we're in the synagogue and the, the man with the unclean spirit shows up, and makes this pronouncement that Jesus is the Son of God, and yet there's no, there's no, um, there's an admission of higher authority, but there's no repentance unto that higher authority. Jesus demonstrates his power over the Spirit, and Mark then jumps out of that moment. If you think the camera just does this pan out, goes to a super wide shot, and then shows us that this word is traveling instantly around the land. And Mark does a little bit of a future forecasting of what happens here in the synagogue. Word is going to travel, and it's going to make him immensely famous. So he gives us a little bit of here's, what's gonna, here's what happens because of that. And then he brings the camera back into the synagogue in present moment. And we go from here, verse 29, forthwith, when they came out of synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Right, So it's a little bit of present moment, camera goes wide, we see kind of the future result, and then we come back to the present moment. Verse 30, Simon's wife, Simon's wife's mother, so Peter's mother-in-law, lay sick of a fever. And soon they tell him of her. That's what the word anon means, soon, very soon. They tell him of her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she ministered unto him. So Jesus here also is going to demonstrate his authority over sickness. And I find it fascinating in the Gospel of Mark, the needs that Jesus meets. We're going to get to one of the biggest ones, but before he gets to that biggest one, he is also meeting some very physical needs. He's going to meet people's hunger. He's going to meet people's um, um, grappling with unclean spirits. He's going to deal with their sicknesses. And of course, all of us in this room, if we're we can all know what it's like to be sick, uh, to be filled with some disease, something that we're not conquering. And if you, if Jesus, if we were living that day and you knew someone had a power to heal that, we would all probably, as much as we could, move heaven and earth to get to this one who could heal them. And what's fascinating when we study the scriptures, while there is such a spiritual element to it, it is not a spiritual element. It is not ever a spiritual element that is removed from the physical. They are collaborative, they are complementary, right? The spirit affects the physical, the physical points to the spiritual. And so Jesus is healing these people um, after he heals his, Peter's mother-in-law, verse 32, and even when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased and them that were possessed with devils, 
and all the city was gathered together at the door. That phrase, they were all gathered at the door, brings to mind the city of Sodom. Because when the angels of God visited Lot's home, almost all the men of the city were gathered at the door. But they were not gathered at the door for healing. They were gathered at the door to fulfill their own lusts. And here we have a, an inverse, an opposite of that. People are gathered at the door. They are riddled with manifestations of sin, and they are coming for healing. It's, it's a beautiful counter image to what happens in the book of Genesis. The, the hope of God was there in the city of Sodom, and it was rejected. The hope of God is here in Capernaum, and the people are gathered at the door hoping and ha- wanting him to heal them. Verse 34, and he healed many that were sick of diseases, and he cast out many devils, and he suffered not the devils to speak because they knew him. There's something fascinating there. Just because you know who Jesus is doesn't mean you get to talk about it, especially if you're the enemy of God. Verse 35, and in the morning, rising up a great while before, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. So we see here a great example of Jesus who in all the activity, he is going to take moments to pull himself away from everyone, and he's going to pull himself away to pray, right? And if, and if Jesus is doing that, how much more do we need to take time to do that? That's a very convicting verse there. So he's healing all these people. Verse, 30, um, verse 36, Simon and they that were with him followed after him, and when they had found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. And Jesus said unto them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also, for therefore came I forth. I came to preach, and I came to teach. I came to heal those who needed to be healed. That's his mission. Um, Verse 39, And he preached in their synagogues throughout all Galilee, and cast out devils. And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him. And here's what the leper said, If thou wilt. The leper recognizes that just because you have the authority over all of these diseases, that you still have to exercise your will. You still have to want to heal me. And the leper, who's already the lowest of the low in the culture of that day, is willing to put himself even lower. He submits to the will of Jesus. If I'm that leper showing up, I'm probably just demanding or begging. And yet, in his beseeching and his begging, he still takes a moment to stop and recognize, I just have to submit. If you are the authority over everything, I must submit to your will, whatever that will is. And there's a very difficult thing here if we go back to verse 14. We saw this in the Gospel of Matthew, but it's still a difficult thing. And pastors talked about it as well. Verse 14 of chapter 1, after John was put in prison, Jesus comes into Galilee and preaches the gospel of the kingdom of God. He does not go and free John. But if Jesus has power over demons, if he has powers over disease, if he has powers over the the natural elements of the world, he certainly could have freed John from prison. Why does he choose not to? And this leper recognizes the will of God. He claims that Jesus not only has the power, but he has the will to. Uh, Pentecost, the theologian says, he notes how hopeless the leper is in the culture of that day. And there's one other person who's almost equally as hopeless, and we'll talk about him in a minute. But the leper was deemed, the reason you had leprosy is because it was believed in by the rabbis and then by the Jewish culture at that time, if you had leprosy, it was because you committed a sin. It was not because you were born into a sin nature and into a fallen world where then sin manifests itself. And we do know that in the Old Testament, there are examples where someone will sin and they will be struck with leprosy. Moses' sister Miriam was touched with leprosy because she sinned. Uzziah, King Uzziah, goes into the temple to perform the acts of the priest, which were forbidden, and he was touched with leprosy. Two examples of... This is sin in your life, and this is the punishment you're receiving. But that's not always the case. And so we have a leper here who has not committed any sin on his own, but if anyone in Jewish tradition saw him, 
They would, one, stay away because it was highly contagious. There was no cure, and it was a, a mortal disease. But then they also attached on top of that, well, you got what you deserved. Okay. Jesus says here in verse 42, uh, verse 41, Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him and saith unto him, I will be thou clean. When we submit to the will of God, his response is going to be compassion. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him and he was cleansed. And Jesus straightly charged him and forthwith sent him away. Mark uses again all these languages fast, immediately, forthwith, straightway. Another word that stands out throughout the Gospel of Mark is the word and. I don't know how many times the word of and has already appeared in the Gospel of Mark, but one of the things the word and does as a conjunction, it ties things together. Mark keeps just using and, 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 and. It's not stopping. He is just going, going. Going, he's keeping it together. You want evidence? Uh, I forget the term in the world of, of law and rhetoric. There's a term used. When we're just going to stack evidence on evidence on evidence on evidence. It's going to happen immediately. Verse 44, Jesus says to the leper who's healed, See thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. But he, the leper, went out and began to publish it much. I love this line and blaze abroad the matter, insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter the city, but was without in desert places, and they came to him from every quarter. So we have a human being who exercises human free will. I want to be healed, but I'm going to lay my will at the feet of the ultimate authority. Please heal me, heal me if you will. Jesus heals him and says, now don't say anything about it. And he turns on and does the exact opposite, right? The mercy of God on us. Chapter 2, so after he's healed the leper, chapter 2, he entered in, he, again, he entered in Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. And this is the great scene of the men taking the roof off of the house and lowering the man who is sick of palsy. And here Jesus is going to perform the miracle of healing the man, but now when Jesus says, the very first thing that is going to get the Pharisees and the scribes' attention and go, okay, it's one thing to heal people. It's another thing to atone people of their sins. So we get down to verse 8. So the man's been lowered down. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 5. Jesus saw their faith, and he says unto the man who's sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there, and they reasoned in their hearts. So they're not talking aloud. Why did this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Now, again, this is not humans can forgive one another back and forth, but none of us can forgive each other our sins. You and I cannot stand before God at the end of days and say, I've been forgiven because my wife forgave me, or my kids forgave me, or my dad forgave me. So it's not going to cut it right? Because that sin nature must be dealt with by the one who is holy without sin. And so Jesus says, I forgive thee, verse 8, and immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, why reason ye these things in your heart? Jesus has an authority over the thoughts of us. He can read our thoughts, and years ago, talking to one individual who said there were some studies done that if you had a choice between two superpowers, to fly or to read people's thoughts, if you chose to fly, the study showed that you were more interested in helping people. If you could read people's thoughts, you were more interested in controlling people. And this is the person you have to watch out for, right? And Jesus demonstrates, I have the ability to read your mind. We cannot hide, right? And so he speaks to them openly. Why do you reason in your heart about these things? Verse 9, why do you reason it's easier to say to the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven, or to say, arise and take up thy bed and walk? This is a paradox. This is a conundrum. Neither one are easy. If someone rolled up in here today who was sick with cerebral palsy and their body was completely contorted and you were given two options, Forgive their mortal soul of eternal damnation 
or heal their body. We couldn't do either one. And Jesus says, why are you quibbling over both of these impossibilities? And he moves on and says, but so that you will know that the Son of Man, again, that's a term Jesus would use for himself to say, I am God-man. I am fully human and I am fully God. So that you will know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, so, so that you guys will see that I can forgive sins. Now he turns and looks to the man who's sick of the palsy, and he says, Arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into thine house. I have healed him of his palsy, and because he has shown faith in me, I have also forgiven him his sins. The two impossible things that you cannot do, I can do both of them. This is kind of the, the flag in the sand moment for Jesus in this gospel. We've already had the moment where God has said, this is my son in whom I'm all pleased, but that was for the people around there who saw it. He's performing all of these great miracles and demonstrated his authority, and now he officially puts his flag in the sand. I am, not He-Man, right? I am the true master of the universe. I can forgive your soul. Your eternal soul can be redeemed. You can be prepared to meet Jehovah through me. That's a huge statement. And watch what the response is. Immediately he took up the bed and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. And he went forth again by the seaside, and all the multitude resorted unto him, and he taught them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the receipt of custom, and said unto Levi, this is also Matthew, follow me. And Matthew arose and followed him. Jesus knows something that's moving in the hearts of us. Some of us need more evidence or more thumping, I guess, if you will. Some of us need less. And who knows what was going on in the life of Peter and James and John? Who knows what was going on in the life of Levi for Jesus just to come up and say, follow me, and he's going to leave his receipt of custom. He's going to leave his table as a tax collector. So again, I said earlier when we talked about how low the leper was, this was the other person in the Jewish culture who was equally as low as the leper, the tax collector. They were considered the worst betrayer unto Israel because most of them were Jews. They were Jews who worked for the Roman Empire to make themselves rich and to keep themselves safe with the Romans, even if it meant being, being dishonest towards their own people. So you wanted nothing to do with a leper. You wanted nothing to do with the tax collector. And yet Jesus knows the hearts of every man, every woman. And the leper shows his faith in Jesus. Jesus accepts him. He knows that Levi Matthew is searching in his heart and has, wants to trust. He says, follow me. And he leaves the table, All right? And when the, after this, Jesus is eating with Mark and with all these publicans and these sinners, verse 16, the scribes and the Pharisees see that he's eating with these people, right? And they ask, how is it that he's doing this? And Jesus heard what they said, and he says unto them, they that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I, I love how the text is put together, what happens next. The irony of what Jesus said is, who is righteous? No one. Who thinks that they're righteous? We do. The Pharisees do. The scribes do. Human beings tend to think, I'm, I'm good. I've got it. So when Jesus says, I've come to call those who know that they need me, He's telling the Pharisees, I'm calling you. I will sit and eat with you if you will eat with me. The question becomes a matter of what is going on in your soul? What is going on with your heart? Is your, I'm going to use a very specific word here because we're going there next. What is the soil of your life like? Are you ready to receive Jesus? So right after Jesus says, I've come to call the sick and not the righteous, he's telling the Pharisees, I'm calling you. We go right into verse 18. The disciples of John show up with the Pharisees, 
and they notice that the disciples of Christ are not fasting. And they ask him, why are they not fasting? And Jesus goes on and gives this great response. He uses the analogy. Now, we will not see the word parable for a few verses, but Jesus is already speaking of parables. Because while a parable is a story that's set in earth that has an immediate heavenly connection, a parable is ultimately an analogy. I'm comparing this to this. I'm comparing this earthly concept or earthly thing to this spiritual concept, right? So when they say, why aren't your guys fasting? He uses the analogy, verse 19. If you're at a wedding feast, can the children of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. You don't fast at a party. Now, you also don't engorge yourself, right? But a party is a time to celebrate, right? Celebrate. Enjoy the moment because the moment will not last that long. Verse 20, now Jesus foreshadows his death. But it, the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then they shall fast in those days. No man soweth a piece of new cloth on old garment, else the new piece that filled it up taketh away from the old, and the rent is made worse. No man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine doth burst the bottles, and the wine is spilled, and the bottles will be marred, but new wine must be put into new bottles. There will come a time when my, my disciples will fast, when the bridegroom's not over here. And there's coming a time when I, not be, I will not be here. There's also a great thought here is there are some traditions, if you will, that are better, ser better performed when you're ready. If we're too new, too immature, some harder traditions probably are not, don't go that route. A very simple example we use to be if you need to start reading the Bible more, don't start in Leviticus. And don't try to read it all in one shot. And don't try to read for an hour. Start with something smaller. Start with just a few minutes. Set a timer even. Set a timer for three minutes and read until, until it goes off. And build up into something. Can't expect someone to start looking at the original meaning of words if they don't have the resources available, if they don't have that knowledge available. So this thing, fasting, is a huge tradition. It is extremely important. Of course, the Pharisees were using it as a way to promote themselves. They were not using it as a way to really get closer to God. So Jesus says, there will come a time for fasting. There will come a time for that. And then we move right from that into verse 23. So after this, the disciples of Christ are walking through a cornfield on the Sabbath day. His disciples began, and they went to pluck the ears of corn. I love this. You all know the Old Testament enough. You know the story of Ruth, right? She gleans the corners of the field. The disciples are not walking through the part of the field that they were unlawfully allowed to go to. They were practicing the law. The law had been set up. You leave the corners of your field for those who were poor or those who needed it. So as they're going through the cornfield, the disciples are actually practicing the law. What better day to practice the law than on the Sabbath, right? And the Pharisees see it, and they interpret it as you're doing work. Eating is work. We're all gainfully employed, right? Right? They've got to eat on the Sabbath day. So watch what Jesus, the Pharisees say, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? Of course, just because the Pharisees said it wasn't lawful doesn't mean it is. And Jesus responds, Have ye never read what David did when he had need and was in hunger, and he that, and they that were with him? He's referring to the book of 1 Samuel. When David shows up to this tabernacle, he says he's on a secret mission for King Saul and says that he needs food. And the, the priest at the time says, you may have the showbread. Even the showbread was not supposed to be eaten. But here is a human being, an image bearer of God, who is in desperate need for food. You feed the man. You meet that physical need. And, of course, one of the tragedies of that story is the priest that would help David would later get slaughtered by Saul. It's, it's kind of the darkest point in Saul's life. A man who helped. Why does the will of God allow that to happen, right? Good luck with that one. Jesus says, haven't you read about David and he was helped? 
And of course, the irony there is the Pharisees had read that. So he's calling them out on it. Verse 26, he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar, the high priest. He did eat the showbread, which is not lawful to eat, but for the priests. And they gave also to them which were with him. So they fed David and they fed their men. Now watch what Jesus says. This is where we've got to end. Jesus is going to use in what is accredited to the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle, he's going to use a syllogism. All right? A syllogism is an argument with three statements. If this is true and this is true, then this is true. All right? But the conclusion that Jesus gives, if we've already had our flag in the sand moment, right? I can forgive the sins of, of you. Watch what he does next. This is so powerful. The conclusion he gives is not the conclusion that necessarily should be there, but it works. He says, the Sabbath was made for man. Man was not made for the Sabbath. So there's the first two lines of your syllogism. We'll back up, for example, one one famous example of a syllogism works like this. Man is mortal. Aristotle is a man. Aristotle is mortal. Because human beings are mortal, and Aristotle is a human being, he is mortal. He will die, right? So Jesus says, the Sabbath was not made, was made for man. Man was not made for the Sabbath. So what should the conclusion be? Give man some grace on the Sabbath day? Watch Jesus' conclusion. Therefore, so because the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath, therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. God's in charge of the Sabbath, not me, not you. And of course, we were told to keep the Sabbath day holy. And the Pharisees are an example of people who have distorted it because they've had all these rules to it, right? That's what we want to follow. Probably the American culture has gone the exact opposite direction. The Sabbath is not kept holy because we're filling it with anything and everything else, right? But these men had neglected the human being who needed help even on the Sabbath. And what did Jesus come to do? He has come to help the human being, and he will help them on the Sabbath day and on every day of the week. But here Jesus again is saying, in case you guys weren't around when I healed that palsy man so that you will know I can forgive people's sins, this holy day unto God, that's my day. I made the Sabbath. I am God. That is, if he has already stuck the flag in the sand, he's just extended the pole upwards, right? And embroidered the flag. How much more evidence do you need? And when the evidence is right there, we will see what these Pharisees will do and what others will do. And we'll stop there and come back next week in chapter 3, all right? Thank you.